Our guest today is an international citizen with an African heart. He is on demand for residency programs with several universities across the globe. But despite this, he decided it was time to come home and contribute his quota to Nigeria and African development. A professor of analytical chemistry from the University of Alabama, USA, he also holds a BSc in chemistry, a master's degree in analytical chemistry from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, also in the United States of America. He is the Director General of the Institute of National Transformation in Lagos, Nigeria, an organization he set up to inspire local minds to take global strides in life and in leadership without any excuses. Joining us via Zoom is our very own Professor Vincent Chinedum Anibogo. Sir, it's good to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a privilege. All right, so I'm going to start with something. Why are you in Nigeria in one of the most precarious times of our history? A man of your stature, many people are running and fleeing to the western side of the country to have a more comfortable life, and you're coming back home here to help. I always tell my Nigerian brothers and sisters, those nations that you are running to, to go and hide, somebody paid the price so that there will be peace, justice, and equity. If all of us run away from Nigeria, who will rebuild it? I think it's high time we came back engage collectively to develop our own nation so that we can bequeath to our children something that is far better than what we inherited. That's why I'm still in Nigeria, sir. A phenomenal answer, sir, I might add. So I'm going to take you away and bring you back to this conversation. I'm looking at your, at your curriculum vitae and I'm wondering first degree chemistry, second degree analytical chemistry, third degree analytical chemistry. Why do you love chemistry so much? <laughs> chemistry was a hobby. I discovered a natural love, not just chemistry, but sciences in general, physics, biology, mathematics. So I fell in love with the sciences very early. And chemistry came very natural to me. Wow. And so naturally I took it to the PhD level. That's very interesting. All right, so your institute, the Institute for National Transformation, one is expecting that as a professor of chemistry, you'd come back and set up an institute for science, but you set up an institute for national transformation. Please help us understand. <laughs> you know, that tells you the difference between hobby and the, your life calling. As I was uh, in the university teaching chemistry, I consistently found that my passion was actually in leadership, in helping people, impacting lives. Every time I received the news about things happening in Africa, whether Nigeria or other parts of Africa, my heart was always being pained. And I kept asking myself, what can I do to help my people? So that body became so strong, I needed it to address it. I knew if I don't answer that call, so to speak, I will regret it. So at an appropriate time, I bowed out of chemistry so that I can pursue my life passion where I know I can make the greatest impact in the life of Africans. So I left America in 2006 and came back to start the Institute for National Transformation, which is my passion. Phenomenal. You are a very lucky man indeed. Most people don't get to do what they like in one lifetime. So you've had the opportunity to do something you thoroughly enjoy that comes naturally to you. And then after that, you're still pursuing your passion. It's an amazing gift you've been given. So I'm going to ask you just to help uh, a number of us. Tell us a bit about your journey from BSCs to master degree to PhD in uh, 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 what is what we can best describe as a foreign land. What was the experience like, the mindsets, the things you experienced? 
experience. Tell us about it. it going to America was one of the most shocking experiences in my life. Wow. Uh, I, I left uh, in 1976, January, and I remembered when I arrived in New York to catch my connect, connecting flight to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I looked out of the window of the airplane and I saw everything everywhere was looking white. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. And I said to myself, these people have a very strange soil, <laughs> not knowing that it was actually snow. Just to tell you how naive I wow. was, when I left. And when I got to Pennsylvania, uh, where I started my bachelor's degree, it was another room awakening. That's when I discovered that I'm black. <laughs> That's when I discovered I was being a Negro. That's when I discovered I was not expected to succeed. Wow. So I, I needed to reach within me and define myself according to who I believe I am, not according to how others have chosen to define me. So that was the first battle, which if I had not conquered, I would have been destroyed by that experience. Of course, with that determination and understanding of self-identity, I knew that I was going to make it in America. And I must say, it would never have happened if I did not embrace the fear of God. Mm. At all times, I wanted to make sure that I have a good relationship with my maker and not dabble into things that would put me in trouble. Many of my colleagues, my Nigerian uh, uh, friends, derailed. So died carelessly. Oh but God preserved me. I finished my BS in, in two and a half years. I was such in a hurry <laughs> to come back to Nigeria. And when I finished my BS degree in two and a half years, I wanted to come home. They said, don't come home. Things are not getting better. I said, okay, while waiting for Nigeria to get better, let me get my master's degree. I finished my master's degree and I called home again. Can I come back now? They say. It's even worse now, uh, after your master's, than it was when you got your bachelor's degree. And I started to wonder, would Nigeria ever get better? While thinking about that, I decided to get my PhD. Of course, by the time I finished my PhD, I was actually told, don't bother coming home. Things are not getting any better. So those of us that found ourselves not really wanting to, to stay abroad. We are forced to stay because we have to make a living. We have to really uh, uh, connect to what is it that life is all about. And so I started teaching and uh, I taught for 20 years, but I knew there comes a time where you become part of the solution, not expecting somebody to solve that problem for you. I decided to go back to Nigeria and be part of the discussion as to how to make not just Nigeria as a country, but Africa as a continent. How do we become as good as any other country? And it's possible. That's what made me come back. Very interesting. Uh, it's good to have you back. And uh, with people like you, it's obvious in certain areas, things are getting be better. One of the areas where we know we are doing better now than we've done in a long time is our elections are getting better, more transparent, and we can count on the results more than we've been able to do in some times in the past. Now, with that being said, after elections come leadership, and you are king on leadership. Now, what are those things you've noticed as you've come back that we need to do um, to ensure that we have the right leadership, the, the next generation of the Nigerian leaders that are growing up, some are still in university, some are finished, they're out in the street. What are those things your first your organization has been doing and what are those things we need to do to get it right in the leadership area? Well, uh, 
my first shocker is that uh, I I discover that leadership leaders are created. They are not necessarily born. Okay. They may be born with the potential, but those potentials must be developed. And I found that too that just because I have a PhD in chemistry it did not make me a leader. I was simply an expert in a particular area. Okay. But I didn't have a full understanding of leadership because leadership has five dimensions according to my understanding. There's the moral dimension. So to be an effective leader, you have to control morally where you can operate from solid ethical and moral foundation. I found that also so to be a good leader, you have to mature emotionally. You must be strong and bold and courageous to do what is right, even when it's contrary to the popular opinion. I found that to be a leader, you must also mature intellectually because organizing and making things happen requires designing systems, implementing them, monitoring them, and adjusting them to be effective and uh, efficient. So I found that, that many of our leaders don't understand systems. In fact, many of our so-called educated people don't understand systems. And everything, whether it's business, education, operate by systems. So I found that, that I was very shadow, even in understanding and designing systems. And also, I found that I had very poor social skills to work with people who do not look like me, who don't think like me, who are not from my tribe, who, uh, who don't practice the same religion. It requires social intelligence to deal with them. Mm. And of course, I, I, as I get older, I realize that I have to eat well, exercise, so that I can do all that I'm supposed to do. So we now inculcate that in all we do. We teach uh, from youth even to uh, uh, adults. We try to help them build those five capacities, you know? And when you have that, then you become a balanced leader. Not only do you understand systems, not only do you have a strong moral value to guide you, but you also know how to deal with people who are difficult, who are different. And I think that's some of what's lacking in Nigeria today. We're way too religious or tribal as sentimentalities that affect quality decision making. And, and the nation is suffering as a result. So, so we are introducing those concepts to the young people at a okay. very early age. All right, so two things I'm going to ask you very quickly uh, because of time. One, how do you get the people to move from sentiment-based thinking to actual factual, you know, uh, proper-based analytical thinking? That's one. And two, I'm going to ask you, you've received residency from several countries around Africa and beyond. What are some of the things that you've been doing that led to those residencies and led to those, uh, those, that degree of honor? First of all, um, if you are going to be less sentimental, you have to operate with facts. So we have to teach our people to research things, get a balanced information so that you can be informed in the decision making. Try and get the two sides of every story. For every story, there are two sides. For every conflict, there are the factual, there are the emotional. Even when you deal with the factual, also try to resolve the emotion. So we must constantly read and research if we're going to remain unbiased. That's number one. Yes, God has helped us. We have uh, established the Institute in many African nations, especially Uganda. 
and then one that South Africa has succeeded the most in, in uh, Uganda. And the reason it has succeeded is that they are more patriotic. They okay. have a heart to come together. And yes, there are tribalism and other things, but they are far more willing to come together to build a nation than, for example, in Nigeria. Our tribal sentiments in Nigeria are very strong, our religious sentiments, and it's very, very difficult to walk across those barriers. Yeah. The work we have done in Uganda has actually resulted in the training of some of their top, top, top leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, His Excellency Museveni awarded my wife and I residency for life because wow. of the impact we have made. In fact, some of our leaders are occupying prominent positions, even cabinet positions wow. in Uganda, and we are very, very uh, proud of that. We are working in Nigeria and other nations. In Rwanda too, we have produced cabinet members in Rwanda. Wow. Again, what is the difference? Rwandese are younger. If you recall the genocide wiped yes. as many of the adults. So the younger generation by accident are being given an opportunity and they are hungry and ready to, to, to cooperate. So they, anything we taught them, they assimilated and applied. We're indeed very, very proud of what our leaders are doing in Rwanda. Fantastic. So I, I, you have some to slides to, you have some uh, slides to show us. Results in Sorry, Sorry sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was saying you have some slides to show us as well as you go on. Some pictures and all. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I have some pictures to show. And uh, will I be allowed to share? Please, absolutely. Go ahead, please. Okay, I, they have not authorized me yet. Please tell them to authorize me to share some slides. All right. I think the studio is doing that right now. Okay, they have not yet. Studio, we're waiting on you. So you can continue while that is okay. I think it's been, you've been authorized now. Okay. Let's see. No, it's still not allowing me. But anyway, we have we have done a lot of work, not just in Ni in Nigeria. Yeah. We have trained the top military officers, for example, in the Navy, Air Force, and uh, in fact, three days ago, I was in Abuja for the National Institute for Public Relations Summit on the uh, Citizen Summit. Oh. And I met one of the top Air Force officers, and he came to me and said, do you remember me? You took me through a training about four <laughs> years ago, and it changed my life. I was very shocked. So he's <laughs> looking forward to coming and spending some time with me. So we have trained top NAVA officers, top uh, army officers. We've also trained top government officials. For example, there are, we have run the retreat for the ESCO of a particular state for the last five years. Wow. And they are seeing the impact. That's so amazing. So we also amazing. training. Let me say something about the nature of our training. Mm -hmm. It is very intensive. It is like a military boot camp. We start in the morning by 5.30 a.m. And we don't end until about 11, 11.30 p.m. Wow. And we can stretch it for even 28 days. We have taken youth that through is a 28 boot camp. day intensive training. And I wish you would meet these youths today. They are radical. They are ready to change Nigeria. They love Nigeria. What am I trying to say? Rigo has a place in developing leaders. And that's the problem with our education system. It's not stretching our people. It is not bringing out the best in them. We need to stretch people so wow. that you can get the best out of them. That's what we're doing in the Institute. All right, so, uh, Professor, I just, we just have about a minute. So I'd want you to talk to the Nigerian youth and talk to the Nigerian and the African people as a way of rounding up on this issue, critical issue of leadership, 
and succeeding in leadership and in life without excuses. I always tell the youth of Nigeria, every challenge we are facing today, some other nations have uh, you know, confronted them and solved them. There's nothing unique about what Nigeria is facing. What it requires is knowledge and a commitment to come together and address it. If we don't know what to do, there are people we can ask and invite and they will help us. There's nothing impossible about Nigeria. All we, all we need is faith, acquire the skills, and be determined. If we have those three things, we will succeed. I totally believe that Nigeria can change and be one of the best countries in Africa, if we so determine. Phenomenal. Um, because you're dealing with Africa, your last few words for Africa before you go. Okay. Oh, so uh, I was saying that because we're dealing with Africa as a whole, could just a few words for Africa and Africans before we go? In the, in the next two months, we're holding a very special conference in Abidjan. We are bringing some of the best leaders in Africa together to discuss. We already, that's the beauty of what we are doing. It's not limited to Nigeria. We are raising leaders in other parts of the uh, other parts of Africa. And the beauty is that they are thinking the same. Once you have taken people through a, the, a set of training, rigorous, methodical training, they all think alike. And so these are the ones we have trained, not, not just in Africa, even in the UK and in the US, they are all coming together to discuss how to impact Africa. So we will continue to do the training across Africa to produce people that are like-minded, passionate, understand what it takes, and willing to pay the price. And so I want to encourage every African out there, Africa can change. But it, reads, it needs required committed people like you and I. I and two will come to your country one day and we will assist you to raise the, the leadership, the expertise, the mindset that's required for Africa transformation. Professor Vincent Animwago, it's been enlightening having you on the show. Thank you very much for sparing us the time from your very busy schedule.